Hello friends, here we are. The Medium's Harvest. The Medium's Harvest by Emmanuel through Chico Charbier. And this is the first edition of the book in Portuguese, published in 1961, given to us very kindly in a very unforgettable, memorable moment in Brazil, like weeks ago. Karina Lisi, thank you so much, Karina. This book was granted to us by her, and it's autographed by Chico Xavier. It's a joy because this book contains the development, the explanation, better understanding of the Medium's book by Kardec. And what is the Medium's book? The Medium's book is the manual. The manual to greater understanding of mediumship. It's not only your mediumship, the mediumship of everybody. It's like studying anatomy. When we study anatomy, we're studying the anatomy of ourselves, the anatomy of human beings. So we're studying the general concept so we can apply these teachings and educate our mediumship. In Spiritism, we learn that when we understand something, we can better apply those teachings in our lives. And yesterday, we were able to verify how Emmanuel is teaching us not only concepts, but a methodology. The methodology of feeling the scriptures. And what does it matter to feel the scriptures? It matters because that's when we are changed. Of course, we, you think the higher spirits are going to bring these books simply to the entertainment of our uh, reason? No. You know, that type of pride does not belong to spiritism. The spiritist circles are never proud of the knowledge that we are acquiring granted by devoted minds of the beyond and incarnated ones. Let us meditate. As this chapter tonight, chapter 7, is about companions. Let's think about our companion Chico Xavier. He gave his life, his time, to us to receive these teachings. Bridge, illuminated bridge he was, of these higher minds that were sent mercifully to illuminate ourselves. Now, what do we do with it? We cannot be like children, can we? Well, we can, but should we? No. You know, when children, Christmas season comes and they indulge in the fact that, oh, we're going to get more presents, more gifts, and we can't forget that there are kids who don't have anything. Same for us as spiritists. How many people around the world have this knowledge? Minority. What are we doing with this knowledge? Good question, huh? And this question pertains precisely to the topic we're going to study this. Welcome everyone who is joining us live. We're going to talk to greet each one of you as soon as we read this message and work on it together but if in the meantime you have questions feel free to share them throughout this session if you're listening to this on demand feel free to write your questions feel free to write your comments and if you're listening to this at cardiac radio send it to us at cardiac radio at gmail.com because we'll be happy to listen from you as we always do okay all right so shall we begin it Emmanuel through Chico Xavier in a meeting on January 25th 1960 the group with Chico Xavier was studying the mediums book and they were studying item 28 for those who are entering today if you're not acquainted with the study of the mediums book the Medium's book contains 32 chapters. But of the 32 chapters, Kardec very educationally divided it in 350 items. 
Each item contains a main concept, a main idea, and we need to pay attention to it. And when we study it, we need to understand and feel it. What was the item that they were studying in this meeting? Visualize Chico Xavier, other friends, studying the medium's book. And then the second part of the meeting is the medium mystic practice. And Emilio comes to Chico and brings to us this chapter. They were studying item 28. What is item 28 of the medium's book? It's about the types of spiritists that Kardec classified. And he didn't classify to make us feel less, but to make us understand where we are, to boost our self-knowledge. What did he do? He said, there are four types of spiritists. Let's see, huh? Which one are we tonight? Okay, but that's not to put us down. It's actually to evaluate and say, what do I need to do next to improve it? So four types of spiritists. One, experimental spiritist. Experimental spiritists, Kardec says, are the ones that believe in spirit phenomena. People will believe it. But for them, it doesn't change a bit in their lives. They don't think about the moral consequences, religious ties to it. It's just about the phenomena. There are many people like this. Second type, hmm? imperfect spiritists. Who are they? They are the ones who believe in the phenomena. They believe in spirits, in God, in Jesus. The concepts, we are incarnated souls, we discarnate and there is a spiritual realm, we reincarnate and we keep on progressing and learning, but they don't apply. And as Kardec says in that item two of, in letter B of, or letter B of item two, 28, he says imperfect spiritism are the ones who think Jesus' teachings are pretty maxims. But come on, the body's too high. These are imperfect spiritists. You know, Christmas season is coming up and December is around the corner. And it's the season when people who understand that Jesus exists and is a big deal. We meditate on it and we reflect and we can almost feel that joy of Christmas season. But does that make a difference in our lives? Or are we planning a Christmas evening just for us? A Christmas day just for us? And our loved ones? As if the rest of the world doesn't really matter. As an imperfect spirit isn't we would have that attitude. But as a Christian spiritist, third type of spiritist, Kardec says, for that spiritist, the true spiritist, the consequences of the knowledge of spiritism change my life completely. My life can never be the same. Inevitably, I'm gonna change. I'm going to change the way I feel about myself, about others. I'm going to change the way I speak, the way I behave, the, the work on my relationships with the self, with others, and God, inevitably. And the fourth type is the fanatical spiritists. Those who are radical, radical to the point they, they're sectarians and then they believe they are superior to others and they are very orthodox. They are almost like inquisitors and they are concerned about the statical part of it. Like they are concerned about the politics of the spiritist movement. They, they are not concerned about reaching out to others. And they feel themselves separated from other people, other religions, other religious people. These are fanatical spiritists. According to Kardec, in item 28 
of the medium's book. Aha! Fantastic, isn't it? What does Emmanuel say about this? Now, let us observe how Emmanuel titles this chapter. Chapter 7 of the Medium's Harvest, Serrara dos Médiuns, in Portuguese. Companions! Emmanuel, just in the title itself, already has a message. That no matter the stage that we are as a spiritist, we're not strangers to one another. We're still companions. You know, in my last trip to Brazil, I became acquainted with a book that was recently, a few years ago, was published by the Brazilian Spiritist Federation, A Treasure. A, the book, of course, is not yet in English, but it was a book written by Dr. Bezerra de Menezes under the pseudonym, the pseudonym Max. And he published that novel in different parts in the Brazilian periodical, Spiritist Periodical, by the Brazilian Spiritist Federation, named O Reformador, that still exists. The book title is Evangelho do Futuro, The Gospel of the Future. It's a fascinating account because Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, in that, in the characters of the story, he is telling us what a true spiritist is about. And you know, believe it or not, and probably friends here will be surprised because I was surprised too. This book was published, not the book, but the chapters that became the book published recently by the Brazilian Spiritist Federation. They were uh, published and written by Dr. Bezerra in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century. And they talk about spiritists, American spiritists from the United States that were not only wealthy, but really Christian spiritists, as we're talking about here, Dr. Caper and his son, later reforming the souls of Brazilians in the northeast of Brazil, in the state of Ceará, and spreading spiritism to Brazilians. Can you believe it? I am very happy that I got this book in my hands and I can share one day with you. But in that novel, Dr. Bezerra de Menezes, very ahead of us, was already ex exemplifying in a novel what it is to be a true spiritist. And Emmanuel begins by the feeling of companions. Feel it, no matter if you or I or others are experimental spiritists, imperfect spiritists, or Christian spiritists, or fanatical spiritists. At the end of the day, we are companions in the journey of life. Emmanuel says, there are many companions who behave this way. They declare themselves spiritists. They proclaim themselves convinced as to the afterlife. They report on marvelous occurrences. They show off unassailable arguments. They frequently refer to wise researchers of the psychic forces. They go from experiment to experiment. They look at mediums as if seeing rare animals. They hold no doubts regarding unusual events originating in their own family, but distrust observations born from the homes of others. They are wonderful conversa conversationalists, remarkable storytellers, but show no change whatsoever. They are in the conviction in their conviction what they are in their denial. Noble exponents of intellectual achievement, they offer nary a crumb of their higher knowledge to others. Blessed with privilege, they will not deign to help anyone. 
unfortunately. However, we have companions in the unceasing battle. They also declare themselves spiritists. They understand that the phenomenon is to the truth, what the shell is to the tr fruit. They see mediums as normal people, needy of help and understanding, in need of help and understanding. They know that life on earth is like a grade in school. And for that reason, they waste no time. They live in constant work. They are indulgent to others, but stricter on themselves. They accept the perfection of justice through reincarnation and welcome suffering as the precise necessary mechanism for polishing their own souls. They recognize that the mistakes of others could be their own and therefore they do not lose their patience. Recognizing themselves to be imperfect, they forgive without hesitation the imperfection of others. And they embody charity as duty, learning and serving always. These are the ones whom Kardec, in his enlightened words, defines as true spiritists, or better yet, Christian spiritists. Emmanuel, in his wisdom there is love. Did you feel it? He calls everyone as companion. This chapter titled Companions is divided in two parts. Two main ideas. One, spiritists that, you know, they believe in all of this, but they don't treat it as natural laws of life. But question to you and I, do you? Do you see mediums as fantastic people above the ordinary people? Do you think the occurrences through mediumship should be treated as wonderful phenomena? Because in the book by Kardec, he clearly says, spirit phenomena are not extraordinary phenomena because they belong to the ordinary realm of life. Right, Silvio Otero, no. It's natural. It's natural for us. So if I tell you this, for example, when we finish this conversation, if you go to sleep, I tell you, see you soon. And you may see ask Vanessa what do you mean see you soon I just mean like we can continue this study session with the real teachers of the beyond as soon as we let the body rest and we meet again for spiritists who know that this is true they're like sure I'll see you soon I've always had these conversations with my grandma in Brazil saying grandma I miss you, but see you soon, during sleep time. Right, Karina? See you soon. <laughs> and, right, sunshine, it's natural. It's natural that we can communicate with one another, mind to mind, telepathy. In the Spirit's book, Kardec talks about this, it's natural. For us, it's for some people, it may seem like, oh, really? No, but not for us. So I would say, we would say that this chapter, it's almost like a checklist. If you take this chapter and you do a checklist, for example, there are many companions who behave this way. They declare themselves spiritists. Do you? Do I? Check. They proclaim themselves convinced as to the afterlife. Do you? Do I? Check. They report on marvelous occurrences. Ah, <gasps> uh, do you? They show off unassailable arguments. 
Do you? They frequently refer to wise researchers of psychic forces. That's what happens. Many people are like this. I see this day in, day out. Oh, that scientist. He talked about the afterlife, but there are many scientists who have been talking about the afterlife for centuries. And including the renowned William James at Harvard. Big deal. They talk about it great. Then, what do they do with it? Do they improve the health system? The psychiatric system? According to what they observed? No. So thank you very much. Yeah, good what you've done. But Kardec exposed himself. He went one step ahead. He was beyond proving. He was about, okay, if that is so, then we need to change everything. For us, we're beyond it. They go from experiment to experiment. Do we? I remember once in 2002, our first spiritist talk in English out of the state of Maryland in California, San Diego. And I remember this person coming to me and saying, I would like to do what Kardec did. And I asked, what do you mean? I would like to do the, his experiments from scratch. And I said, why? Because I want to see for myself, okay. But why? In science, we don't do this. If somebody already proved that gravity exists, we go to the next question. We ask ourselves what NASA is asking. What is the impact of gravity in healing, for example? And then we do experiments out of sp in space. That's the next question, but we don't go back, otherwise we never progress. And as a science, we go beyond experiments. Mm -hmm. They look at mediums as if seeing rare animals. Do you? Do you look at mediums like, oh, no, we don't. They hold no doubts to regarding unusual evidence originating in their own family, but they distrust the ones that are elsewhere. So it's like this, for example, I tell you, Mentor Joseph comes and talks to me, but not only Mentor Joseph, but other spirits too. And for some people, like, really? Mm, who is this Mentor Joseph? Mm, I need to call Sherlock Holmes to investigate this spirit that is talking through Vanessa. Okay. But if talks through them, or through somebody that they are close together, they're like, oh yeah. This is the imperfect spiritist. Mm-hmm. We're not saying we're gonna believe and be gullible, but we're not gonna have this hesitation just because we have some questions regarding the familiarity of that medium. For example, we know there are many mediums who are not spiritists, and they are great, they are fantastic. Like John of God. John of God in Abadia, in Brazil, is not, he doesn't consider himself a spiritist. And is he a medium? Yes. Is he for real? Yes. Is he infallible? No. Is there an infallible medium on earth? I don't think so. The only one we knew is the medium of God, Jesus, according to Kardec in the book Genesis. But if we think about James von Prague, is he a medium? Of course. And just because he's not a spiritist, I'm not going to validate his mediumship. That's what we're talking about. That's what Kardec is talking about. They are wonderful conversationalists. They like talking about it, remarkable storytellers but they don't change. They don't, and 
blessed with privilege, they will deign, they will not deign to help anyone. So we need to ask this question. If we know this little tiny much of spiritism, this Christmas cannot be only for us. We need to think, as Leon Denis says in the book after death, of those who don't have a Christmas like ours and grant them an opportunity to feel it. I'm just giving an example about Christmas, but it could be anything. Every day, like Mentor Joseph says, if you buy something for you, Vanessa, Think about those who don't have what you have. Think about how you can provide to someone else a similar joy. How often do we go to restaurants? And then we go and we think of others who have no food whatsoever. Or we do our nails. Like we go do manicure, pedicure. And we think, wow, how many women, even men, they work, 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 and they never have time or money to take a little care of their bodies. What can I do to share this joy? I take one, I give one. I take one, I give one. I take one, and I give one. Remember the spirit mentor of Virginia telling me, Raise her showing that if she is granted a toy, she also needs to think of others, other children who don't have toys. She needs to constantly exercise this. A toy for me, a toy for somebody else. A toy for me, a toy for somebody else. Not only for herself. It's not easy. Tell you the truth. It's not easy. But it's important. How do we get out of selfishness? By practicing the opposite. Usually in our emotions, we are used to repressing bad emotions, like feeling selfish. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm feeling so selfish. And I pretend I'm not seeing it. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to pretend I'm not seeing it. Don't talk about it, don't talk about it. No, 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 the best thing is say, okay, I'm going to practice the reverse as an antidote to dilute it. Okay, now I feel selfish. What do I do? Practice altruism. I feel selfish. I practice altruism. How? I immediately do what Leon Denis says. You're going to eat. Don't eat before thinking of those who don't cannot eat. Either because they are in a hospital or because they are in a particular health condition, they need a special diet. Can you imagine eat, eating like like a dessert, delicious dessert, and those who cannot eat it? That's how we practice in our thoughts first. And then in action, not giving chocolate to others because that's probably not too charitable. <laughs> but, or it depends. If they are, you know, just once in a while, it's okay. But thinking about those who don't have actually money. Think about the refugees around the world. It's unimaginable. Unimaginable, especially those who have children. Providing for children without being at home. If they are sick, there is no immediate resource, there is no market, there is no money, there is no work. You are at the mercy of whatever. That thought needs to constantly feed our minds and say, I need to be diligent at working with my time and those resources we have at hand. Emmanuel has a beautiful chapter in the book, Living Spring. He says, for this much, we may open centuries of blessings for us, and for this much, 
we may open centuries of terrible experiences for us and others. So that's why he says we need to give more value to time and the resources we have at hand to be wiser in the use of both. And that's what Emmanuel says here in the book, The Medium's Harvest, chapter 7. He says, checklist, huh? Again, they also declare themselves spiritists, so both companions. See, both companions. The imperfect and the Christian, the true spiritist. But the understanding that the phenomenon is to the truth what the shell is to the fruit, meaning, think about the banana and the skin of the banana. What are you going to eat? The skin or the banana inside? The inside of the banana. So phenomenon is like the skin, but what matters is what is inside of it. If Dr. Bezerra de Menezes comes through Divaldo Franco and delivers a message, oh, Dr. Bezerra brought, came here to the United States and delivered a message. Okay, so what was the message? I don't remember, Vanessa. So then, what's the point? The phenomenon in itself? So what has he said? I don't remember. No, but he delivered a message. But what did he say? I don't remember. You see? The true spiritist not only remembers, but he took notes, and he's going to follow through. Not because it's Dr. Bezerra de Venezes, but because the message is important. Because the, the name that's signed is not more important than the message itself. Mm -hmm. For the true spiritist, they see mediums as normal people in need of help and understanding. When you see Divaldo Franco, he needs help and understanding. No, yeah, but he has help, superior help. Well, but if you pinch, it hurts. He needs to eat like we do. He needs to sleep like we do. He needs affection like we do, etc., etc. And we demand and demand and demand. The true spirit know, the spiritist knows that life on earth is like a passing time. And we need to apply ourselves to graduate. Huh? Like going to school. They waste no time. So that's why it's hard work, hard work, hard work. They live in constant work. Constant work. So when there are people who tell you you're working too much, helping others, like Jesus said to Peter, that voice doesn't come from good spirits because the good spirits are always going to tell us, when you finish this, there's another one. Never stop. In nature, the plants don't stop producing because they have already produced the year before. It's time. Let's keep working and renew. If you watch the documentary March of the Penguins, you're going to be shocked. I was shocked to see how hard workers penguins are. They live to work for their survival. Mamma mia. It's easier to be a human than to be a penguin. <laughs> for sure. It's much easier. Because we can indulge sometimes doing nothing. Yeah, they can't. If they do, they die. And they're, and the whole family. And it's like boom, boom, boom. One step next to the other. One season finishes another one. They need to be ready or they die the whole life, the whole life. Everything in nature shows incessant work. Why do we humans have the illusion that we should produce once and that's it and admire that work forever there is always progress as Divaldo Franco said to me once Vanessa I said what is the secret to this constant journey he said Joanna taught me 
I keep aiming at the next. Keep aiming at the next. What's the past is blessed. But I don't stop to admire it. She says, keep aiming forward. Progress. Work. What's next for you? Hmm? For me. Now he's going to talk about the moral side as we wrap up this section. They are indulgent to others and stricter on themselves. That's hard. And indulgence is such an interesting word. Indulgence is like this color, pink. It's soothing. It's calming. It's kind. And the root of the word indulgence, if you go to the Latin origin, you're going to see indulgere. Indulgere comes from dolce. Uh huh. Like the Italian, the Latin origin. It's to sweeten, to put in some dolce. Dolgere. Indulgere. To sweeten the mistake of others. We're not used to do that. We're used to paint in dark colors the mistakes of ours and others. So we need to practice how? Beginning with ourselves. When you make a mistake, how do you feel? Terrible? Do you feel like drinking, escaping from reality? Or are you able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is bitter, but I am a child of God and I will begin anew. I will start over. I know I can recover from it. I know I can repair it. And I don't waste time in guilt because guilt is paralyzing so I sweeten that mistake as grave as it is because sooner or later we have to do it I am a child of God if you remember the song I am a child of God I am a child of God I reincarnated to learn to do good learn need to learn and that's how we learn making mistakes it's impossible to learn without making mistakes almost impossible a mistake is about an imperfect trial so I try again and look at myself in the mirror and do the mirror work that Louise Hay said Look at yourself in the mirror every day, even when you make a mistake and say, I am a child of God. God loves me. So do I. God loves me. So do I. God trusts me. So shall I. I know I'm going to overcome. I can already see myself joining hands with those people who I made a mistake with or that made a mistake towards me. We're going to be friends. I already see us as friends. I already see us walking together, etc., etc., okay? And accept the perfection of justice so I know that everything that happens to me, there is a reason. I recognize that the mistakes of others could be my own. That's interesting. And therefore, I don't lose my patience. Mamma mia. There is a story about this I read in a child's book. It's about a penguin and a seagull. Because the penguin ate the lollipop of the seagull. And... The seagull was very upset to the point that no apology would make him happy. He was grumpy. So the penguin was like, you need to help me to the reader because seagulls 
when you make a mistake towards them, they're very grumpy. So one day the penguin was diving in water and he found a lollipop underneath the underwater. So he got the lollipop and gave it to the seagull. The seagull was very happy with the lollipop. But immediately after, they all find out, found out that the lollipop belonged to the whale. And the whale was upset with the seagull. And it was in that scenario that the seagull learned that, you know, mistakes happen. And why be grumpy towards the mistakes of people? If you yourself can make a mistake. That's exactly what Emmanuel is bringing to us here. It could be us. It can be us. And soon after, we'll realize that we're just fallible, as fallible as other people. They embody charity as duty, learning and serving always. This is the true spirit, is my friends. For them, mediumship is just natural. Mediums are people like anybody else. Learning and serving always. Yes, that's what it is. Right, Silvio Tero? Thank you for being with us. And here we have Teresa Catapano with us as well. Andrea Torres, my beautiful friend. You know, Andrea, we're on the same journey learning together. And Adilson with us. Michel Silva with us. How are you, Michele? Yes. Constance and her husband with us. What a joy. Anthony and Constance. Erica, beautiful Erica. Lisa Telly. Sunshine. Leonor Pacheco. What a joy. What a joy. Teresa Castro. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Seissa is here with us. What a blessing. My friends, here we are. And I'm opening here just to double check because sometimes my phone doesn't show everything. The other friends who are here with us, I know. And I want to say hi to you and to those who are coming. It's so funny because yesterday we had Ana de Oliveira. And I thought it was Ana from Alabama, who is Ana de Oliveira. And we found out that Ana de Oliveira is in Australia. And then... We introduced Anna from Alabama to Anna from Australia. And this is our beautiful Intercontinental Spirit Center here in the 11th hour of the day with the good spirits. It's really amazing. I was happily surprised to see everybody there and new friends making friends, right, Brianna? Right, Andrea Nas. How are you, Anna Oliveira is here. Karina Lisi, McCurphy, Claire P. Big, big, big hug. Rosaline Rosa, Victoria Baker, Julia Duarte, how are you? Emmanuel Dizon, if I may say this way. Angelita Fraternity Without Borders, Renata Casadei, how are you, Renata? Hmm? Angelita, are you coming to the event? We need to put a table for the t-shirts of Fraternity Without Borders here, the event of the Spirit Side of Virginia on December 3rd. Come on over, right? Why not? Why not, Teresa Castro? And here we have it. Who else? I wanna say everyone I can see here. If I'm not saying it, forgive me. But what's gonna happen tomorrow? We're deepening our studies with Emmanuel. And tomorrow, it's about a higher knowledge. When we talk about mediumship, we talk Oh, Broody is here, I can't tell, Broody. Higher knowledge. Higher knowledge is specifically a breakdown that Emilio gives to us on fanatical spiritists. Ay, ay, ay. What is he gonna say? Mamma mia. Just as a teaser, huh? Mm -hmm. He says, <clears throat> Never think 
that the presence of generous and tender spirits is enough to ascertain your spiritual evolution. What, Vanessa? I don't know. Come back. It's going to be chapter 8, Higher Knowledge, on the medium's harvest. Learning and serving always. Big hug. Oh, Constance, you want to pray? For sure. I pray this. Okay, Constance. So let us raise our thoughts and feel these generous and tender spirits that Emmanuel is telling us, shall we? Can you imagine Fred Gouveia now playing the violin and a friend singing the Ave Maria as the background music? Can you feel it? Let us pray. Dear Mother, Father God, you know our needs. You know what we need and what we don't need. But we think we need. Please give us the needed surrender and understanding to feel the blessings of life. We ask you kindly to please give us strength to go through the needed trials and never give up. Give us the needed resilience and above all else, help us feel your infinite and unconditional love. We thank you for sending these teachings and especially for sending the illuminated minds of the beyond through the hands of Chico Xavier to lead us into new understanding, learning and serving always. And so be it. Thank you, friends. A big hug. And until tomorrow, God willing,